Redirecting to Facebook. I think we are live, or I think I am live. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to load up my video in front of me here so I can see what you guys are saying. Uh oh. I think we are live, or I think I am live. Hello, everybody. Why is that doing that? There we go. Okay. Sorry, everybody. That was less uh, less organized than usual, but actually, it doesn't look like anybody's watching it anyway, so it doesn't matter. Hey, everybody. I'm Brock Armstrong. I am the Get Fit Guy over at quickanddirtytips.com. Also over at brockarmstrong.com where you can find out all about my coaching and all of that kind of stuff. And while I'm talking about websites, quickanddirtytips.com just released a brand new version yesterday afternoon, I believe it was. And it is um, stellar, I got to say. It is such a huge improvement not to uh, to poo-poo the old version of the website, but... The new one is significantly better. So if you haven't checked it out yet, go to quickanddirtytips.com and that's where you can find me. And you can also find, and I'm just going to do the big unveil here. You can also find Monica Reinagel, the nutrition diva, <laughs> who's hey crashing the workout of the I'm week this week. Totally crashing the party. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you here and the reason there's a few reasons why why uh, Monica is here and that's because she actually received a question last week that was somewhat workout related somewhat nutrition related so we decided that we do it together I also received another question that was very much nutrition related and as much as I love to um, talk out my butt about nutrition I thought it'd be a lot better to have a real nutrition expert here and also we've got a little little thing we want to tell you guys about but we'll wait uh wait a little bit before we get into that um yeah, so i hope megan um is watching today because she was the one that posted last week for table talk she said here's a question for both monica and brock and i thought well let's wait until we can both tackle this together because it was a yeah. really juicy question so, mm -hmm. so yeah hope. one that we actually had to do a significant amount of research on well significant a little bit of research on and we had a a meeting that was sort of ended up being almost dedicated to debating the pros and cons of it. So I think it'll be a good discussion. Yeah. But it wouldn't be workout of the week if we didn't talk about our workouts of the week. So okay. I hope you're ready to, to talk about yours. I can go first if you need to think about yours. Go ahead. Okay. My favorite workout this week was I went to a pool, an outdoor pool in Vancouver here um, called the Kitsilano Pool. And it is 137 meters long. <laughs> Now, usually, like most pools are 25 meters long. The pool that, that like I some round number of cubits or something. It's yards, 150 yards. Oh, hey, I'm American. I should know that. Yeah. So it was it. This pool is so old that it actually like back in 1982, I believe, is when Canada went completely metric. So this pool predates our switch to metric. So it's 150 yards, 137 meters. But just uh, just to give you an idea of how big that is, like 25 yards or meters which are pretty close because it's a small amount. That's the usual size of a pool. The pool that I normally train at is 50, and that's a considered an Olympic distance pool. This one is <laughs> more than double that, almost triple that. So it is fantastic for those of us who really um, are preparing more for an open water sort of situation. Like most triathlons that I do are actually 99% of the triathlons that I've done in my triathlon career have been open water, like whether they're in a lake or a quarry or the ocean. And so I love the fact that you, I don't have to turn around every 25 meters or every 50 meters. Now, that being said, there was something in my brain that knew that I was in a pool. I could see the marks on the bottom of the pool and I actually marked off 25 meters, 50 meters and stuff. I, the first couple of times across the pool, I actually started to have a bit of a panic reflex because I, my brain somehow thought I'm in a pool. Why haven't I had that chance to like sort of touch the side, grab a breath, push off or do the flip turn and you get sort of that extra push or that relax sort of thing. So it actually did take a little bit for me to sort of flip that switch in my brain to more encourage myself to think of it as an op open water swim instead of a instead of a pool swim but once i got into the groove it was awesome it felt great it was about 14 degrees out and overcast so there were not very many people in the outdoor pool so i kind of had it a little bit to myself there's actually a guy in a in a wetsuit <laughs> in swimming in a parka what <laughs> I, the water was warm 
but it's a saltwater pool too, which is really nice. So you're not covered in chlorine. So it's a saline pool. So yeah, that was, it wasn't like a really fancy killer workout per se, but it was very enjoyable and, and really nice to get, get into the water outside, not on, in the sun, but in the uh, great outdoors and, and get to swim without having to turn around every 25 meters. So that's my workout of the week. How about you, Monica? I got to tag this morning's workout as my workout of the week, which um, started out pretty regularly. I have a, a short little route that I run. So I belong to a gym that's only about a quarter of a mile from my house. Um, but I have a, sketched out a route, that a running route. So I'll run, you know, my about two and a half miles to, to the, get to the gym. And I actually felt pretty good on my run today. Um, the last few runs I've taken, I kind of feel like, okay, the run, like I completed it. That was the best thing that happened about that run today. It was like, this feels better than just getting through it. This feels actually good. But the best part of the workout happened when I got to the gym. And this is actually um, a thank you to you, Brock. So what you all watching don't know is a few months ago, I was complaining to Brock that um, I had some tendonitis in my elbow. And so I wasn't able to do bicep curls. It was hurting the tendons in my elbows and it had been going on for so long. I felt like my, I was losing tone and strength in, in my arms. And he said, well, you could do chin-ups instead. That would work your biceps, but would work a whole bunch of other things too. And I said, oh, Brock, I can't do a chin-up. I will never be able to do a chin-up. And he said, why not? Why could you not do a chin-up? And challenged me um, to make that a goal, to do an unassisted chin-up, you know, before I die, which is, that was my original <laughs> yes. goal. I've, I've, Way I've, before you die. Right, right. I've since shortened my time frame because... <laughs> I've discovered that I actually have been able to make progress towards this goal, which I only am doing because you helped me set it. That was one of those things that I just had in that category of things Monica cannot do, you know, an unassisted chin up. So I've been steadily um, using a resisted weight machine that, that add, you know, that um, pushes me up a little bit and slowly decreasing the weight. And this morning when I got to the gym and I was doing my things, I was, I'm only using 30 pounds of assistance now. So I'm getting really nice. close yeah. to being able to do an unassisted chin up or pull up. I can never quite remember what the difference between them. I think it pull has ups to that way, chin ups that yeah. way. Uh, I'm, I'm actually using my hands like this because that's how the bar is on. It's our a hammer. Half, halfway between, yeah. but I'm getting close. And that's really exciting to me just because it was, like I said, something that I never thought I would be able to do. Um, and I think I'm actually going to be able to do it thanks to you, Brock. So thanks for that little kick in the, in the rear. That's, that's going to be, so when I actually get to my first on a sudden, you have to have me back on work out of the week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it does escalate it. It'll, you'll get your gains will be get quicker and quicker at a certain point too. A lot that. of the first part of the, the first gains will actually be neuromuscular. So you're actually training your body to communicate better with the muscles that are required for that particular movement. If you're not doing that movement, your body doesn't necessarily know what it needs to do. So it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, should I pull more with this, with that? And then as yeah. a natural sort of progression, we humans are lazy and we build efficiencies to everything that we do repetition. And that's sort of that 10,000 hour idea is that after that's a certain amount of yeah, after a, after a certain amount of repetition, your body just gets more efficient at doing it because the neuromuscular connections are there. It remembers like the the neurons that um, fire together, wire together kind of idea. Um, so that would be the first portion, and then you start building the strength, and that often sort of picks up speed at a certain point as well. At a certain point, you'll plateau, but that's going to be when you're doing like thirty unassisted chin ups. Not not right now. I was going to say, I hope it doesn't plateau before I get to one because. Nope. Okay, so um, let's jump into that that question. I'm going to read yeah, it, the one it. that we got or that you got from Megan, and says, "Hi, Monica. A question for you, and in all caps, Brock. What is your take on the reverse calorie on reverse calorie dieting? Reverse calorie dieting, as is often practiced by fitness competitors. Is this legit or just a clever sounding theory? Thanks a bunch." So first we had to find out what is this theory? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a, a bit of trying to separate it out because there does seem to be a few different variations or versions of it, depending on if you are like um, Megan mentioned a, a fitness competitor 
or right. so if I think you're... we both had a slightly different idea about what that meant because we each yeah. looked into it separately. And yeah, you, your angle was more from that fitness competition angle. Yeah. So they both basically have the same main components, which involves some sort of caloric deficit. So some sort of reasonably extreme diet, like a, a real crash kind of diet um, that may or may not incorporate some sort of an exercise regime as well. I've seen both versions again, followed by, and this is where the reverse part comes in, followed by instead of just sort of going, hey, I'm at my goal weight and starting to eat like normal, there's actually a very controlled, do you call it a, a titration? It's a reverse yeah, titration, yeah. I guess. That's the word that came to mind for me too, yeah. So you're actually introducing, and, and one, of the one, one of the versions I saw was 100 calories per week you add back in from that original calorie deficit. Right. So say you're usually taking in 2,000 calories a day you go on a diet and you're only taking in, let's say 1200 calories a day, which is nothing that Brock or I would ever recommend, but let's say <laughs> yeah. you eat it anyway. This is the face I make at that. Right. <laughs> you're eating 1200 calories a day until you achieve whatever, you know, some goal or you hit some weight or something. And then instead of going back to 2000 calories a day, you work your way back up 1300, 1400, 1500. So, you know, that's the, the basic concept. And yeah. then a lot of sort of theory and woo gets kind of piled on top of that about why you do that and what's happening or what you're preventing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and one of the things I thought this was an interesting wording choice. One of the things that I saw and actually thank you, Morgan, for being here again with Hi, us. Morgan. Morgan's our, our awesome social media expert and she's posting links for us as we, as we talk here. Morgan just posted a link to a muscle for life article that actually talks about what I was just going to mention, which is the sort of word choice of when you, when you have that big of a caloric deficit, Monica and I often talk about how it damages or impairs your metabolism at, at a certain point. Um, now in this article, it actually makes sure that it points out that this isn't damage, that it's actually an, an adjustment. Now, I, that's semantics, but I think that's a, a interesting thing to, to discuss. Yeah. yeah, I guess we assume that a lower metabolism is not the goal. Yeah. That's why we tend to, you know, everybody's looking for a faster metabolism, not a slower one. But through that huge caloric deficit that, that the reverse diet does ask for in that first step, there often is or will be a metabolic down regulation <laughs> to, to take any sort of judgment talk use scientific speak to make it sound non-judgmental it's not a it's not damaged or impaired it's, it's just, just slower down regulated so the idea is at that point the the reason why you need to introduce the calories slowly is so you don't have that huge rebound so you're because you were able to live on a 2000 calorie diet but then you brought it down to that 1200 just going back to that 2000 calorie diet again, you're likely to put on a lot of fat right away. Like it's, you're not going to gain muscle that quickly. So you have the potential to put on a lot of fat and really undo what you've spent all that time and energy and oh, just misery right. doing. Yeah. What this really is about is that uh, when you are doing that sort of dieting, when you're done dieting and all of those are concepts that yeah. I would like to reject and throw out yes. the window, but you know, when you're done dieting, you can't just go back to the way you were doing before because you will now need fewer calories to maintain that lower weight. And so maybe just from a very practical point of view, um, you know, aside from any story that we might tell about metabolism or whatever, that gradually increasing your calorie intake would be one way to find out where your new equilibrium is, when, mm. you know, at what calorie intake you can maintain this lower weight and what, what will start to um, uh, bring about slow uh, rebound weight gain. And the sad news is, and maybe this is why you have to do it so gradually, is that that new number is almost certainly going to be a lot lower than you think and hoped yeah. <laughs> and want it to be because of that rapid weight loss. Because the other thing that gets um, changed, we won't say damaged, Besides your metabolism, when you do uh, a rapid weight loss or a big, and you know, by rapid, we mean also just like standard two pounds yeah. a week, right? Yeah. The other thing that changes besides your metabolic rate is your body composition, right? 
yeah, you can't lose just body fat when you're dropping weight that quickly. We've seen many, many studies that that show that time and time again, that you, you lose some water right off the bat, you lose some body fat, but if you're losing at that, what we consider to be sort of a regular um, amount of weight, you're also losing lean muscle, which also has an impact on your metabolism. Right. Or your even calories. just, your, yeah, your calorie, your overall caloric needs drop as you, as you drop muscle. And I guess that's part of why the reason that the version of the reverse diet that I was looking at originally, or was thinking of also incorporates on that when you're increasing your calories again, it also increases the amount that you're lifting. So you're actually doing some real hypertrophy or muscle building kind of workouts. And that's also, that's part of the, the reverse part. So you're, you're cutting your weight, you're doing things like a lot of cardio and, and things like that while you're on that really low caloric intake. And then you increase the, the hypertrophy workouts. And that would be for those fitness competitions. So you're really trying to maximize when you are putting that weight back on that it's not fat, it's, it's muscle. So does it work? Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe better, uh, it would avoid the problems with simply, you know, returning to your previous calorie intake level. Yeah. yeah. It's if you are going to go that route of the extreme caloric deficit and losing weight at that considered normal rate, but what Monica and I consider to be too fast, um, then yeah, that's the, probably a smart way to go safest. about sort of reintroducing it. It's the safest way. It's a, it, it's yeah. Smart's probably not the, not the concern at this point. Cause really like, and the reason that we're both sort of making these faces and hedging our, our bets a little bit is that why would you go like the, the main thing that kept coming up for us was why would you go through all that effort and all that planning and all that misery of cutting your calories that drastically only to return yourself to a more sort of reasonable caloric intake, I suppose, Instead, why wouldn't you just drop your caloric intake a small bit and adjust your, your meals and adjust things that way instead? Yeah, I mean, this is essentially the exact inverse of the approach that, that Brock and I have spent a lot of time developing and, uh, and now um, champion in our joint uh, program called the Wayless Program, where we help people with sustainable fat loss and you know fat loss with minimal disruption to the metabolism and body composition and and essentially it's the exact opposite of reverse dieting you know instead of having you know that really big uh, drop in calorie intake and then you know sneak back up to see where you can stabilize we do it exactly the opposite we start where you are we do a very gradual reduction of calorie intake so that we can you know, start to reduce fat without losing any of the lean muscle tissue, without the disruption to the metabolism. And then we find from the other direction, where can we stabilize here? Um, and, and our belief and, and the research um, uh, supports the fact that when you do it this way, the, the, the way that, that we outline, your stabilization level is likely to be a lot higher than it will be if you go to the, you know, if you jump into the canyon and then crawl out you're going to have to stop at a lower level than if you, uh, you know, get into your, your paraglider with us <laughs> <laughs> and coast it down, you know, your stabilization uh, level is going to, is going to end up being higher because you've avoided that loss of that unnecessary loss of lean muscle tissue and that down regulation of, uh, of, of your metabolism in response to that. And I see we have some people coming in and saying, hi, hi, Bo. Hi, Michael, yeah. some questions, but, uh, yeah. So, what, what did, was there your thoughts about reverse dieting? Go any, you know, did you turn up any new things since we talked? Or no, no, that was that was basically it. That we really, I would rather see people not damage and then re have to rebuild. I don't know, yeah. Rebuild. Just instead, why not just sort of do it? You end up in the same place, and and one in. It, sort of creates a new lifestyle rather than something you have to measure so closely. Like if you're increasing your calorie intake by a hundred calories per week after being on a caloric deficit of like a few hundred or maybe a thousand calories for a while, it just seems like not only is that a lot of effort, but that's a lot of strain and, and stress and it's not sustainable. And I always, we talk about this a lot, but I always talk about how you need to have an exit strategy for any sort of new program that you start. 
And the exit strategy for that one is constant vigilant monitoring. And I don't think that's necessarily ever the right answer. At least it is an exit strategy because yeah. most crash crash diets just abandon you there at the bottom. And yeah, it's like, yay, you made it. Right. You're on your own. <laughs> so, okay, faint praise maybe. At least there is an exit strategy. But um, yeah, I think that people somehow feel like this is going to be faster, you know, to, yeah. to get the weight off quicker and then deal with the consequences. And, you know, and it may be faster at first, but because so many people end up overshooting and rebound weight gaining, and then they have to do it again, in the long run, it's not faster. No. <laughs> you know, you don't actually get where you're going any quicker because you can't, you don't stay there, you know? And, yeah. uh, and so in a very sort of paradoxical sort of Aesop's fable kind of way, what we're seeing is that this super slow way that we, um, you know, have been advancing ends up actually uh, not only being safer and less unpleasant, but um, I think people end up crossing the finish line quicker, you know, yeah. and still heads held high, you know, and with plenty of uh, energy, not, you know, sort of collapse, you know, throwing themselves across the finish line and throwing up on the sidelines. You know, yeah. <laughs> these people are, are kind of, you know, sailing across that finish line and into the rest of their lives, safe in the knowledge that they've, they've got this to keep now, that it's not something that they're going to have to, you know, uh, white knuckle to, to hold on to so yeah yeah so without and, turning this into a commercial um <laughs> i i posted the link in the in the little chat box there and if you want to know more about the program that we've referenced a couple of times during this and and the reason why we've done so much research on on the yeah. rate of fat loss and stuff like that is way less dot life is the website for some reason it didn't turn it into a link there in the, oh, in the okay. comment box so maybe um we'll post it again before before the end and see if i can make it clickable somehow but um but yeah that's the that's the program if you want to learn more there's also um lots of lots of blog posts that we'll be posting and stuff about all the research we've done because we want to share all this information it's been really really eye-opening yeah and that program actually um kicks off just once a year and it's about to kick off in about yeah. three or more weeks or something like that and right now actually we're in an early registration uh phase where it's actually a little cheaper right now <laughs> between now and Friday. So if you're even remotely interested, scoot over there and check that out because this will be the lowest price for that program. But yeah. Okay. Now I have one other question that would really benefit from having you here, Monica, yeah. and that's from Chris, Chrissy. And she said, hi again, can you talk about carbs to help with weight loss and control cravings? Uh, or, and then she said, if you have a link, you could send that as well. And I did send her some links and, and Morgan will post those in the, in the chat here as well. But, um, but yeah, so carbs in terms of, um, weight loss and controlling cravings. Well, I think, you know, we, we have at this point, a copious amount of research showing that, you know, that there's no magic formula in terms of weight loss that, you know, uh, a certain number of carbs or keeping it under a certain low carb diet, moderate you know, is not the magic trick for losing weight. You can lose weight on any number of um, macronutrient recipes, you know, uh, from very low carb to moderate carbs, even, you know, reasonably high carb. Um, what ends up making the difference is what you feel like you can sustain. And so, you know, we have a, a saying um, that the best diet for you is the one that you can stick to long term. So, uh, some people definitely, and I think there's a lot of individual variation to this. Um, I think you've seen this too, Brock. Yeah. Some people feel like when they really eliminate, and usually this has to do with not carbs, all carbs, uh, but the starchy carbs. So they leave yeah. the vegetables in place. Please leave the vegetables in place, right? And often the fruit, and, but they kind of look at uh, bread, pasta, you know, the, the starchy carbs and ratchet those back anywhere from a little to almost entirely, find that eventually they don't crave those foods anymore. And they almost certainly have taken a lot of calories out of their diet. And those are usually not super nutritious calories. Yeah. So it's not like they're, they're losing much. And this can be a recipe that they find not only effective for weight loss and cravings, uh, but also for maintenance. Yeah, yeah, that's something that worked really well in, in our household anyway, was getting rid of the, the pastas and just always having bread on hand yeah. instead strategically buying bread when we really 
wanted it for a specific purpose and specific recipe, not just having it in the fridge. And honestly, I, other than a couple of like fancy Italian restaurants that we visited on vacation, I don't remember the last time we had pasta in the house. And it wasn't like one of those big sacrifices that we made where it's like, we're never eating pasta again. Mm. It was just a, Hey, let's try scaling back on this. And, and Monica's right. Like you definitely lose your palate for it at a certain extent. And it doesn't become one of those go-to meals and and instead you start making things like great big salads with the or roast vegetables or roast squash or something with or the spiralized the, zucchini or something yeah pasta or but oh. yeah it wasn't some panacea getting rid of those by any means it was really it's quite obvious when you look at what we're eating versus a whole bunch of processed flour and and stuff and we're eating a whole bunch of really nice vegetables instead there's no magic there there's no mystery right. why why we're we lost some weight and felt better and and our cravings got a little bit more controllable but i just wanted to put in one little footnote for chrissy and that is that you know sometimes i have certainly worked with people who have gotten on a, a, the low carb bandwagon and taken a much more absolute all right no, no more pasta ever again no more bread no more you know carbs ever at all and really um you know focus their diet and uh and found that they just never felt full or satisfied, you know, mm. and, and, and it really didn't, they didn't feel better. Um, and, and they really, even after, you know, giving it a week or a couple of weeks to kind of accommodate to that, to that new lifestyle. And I think that for some people having a small amount of whole grains, complex carbohydrates does just make their engine run a little bit better, it gives them a feeling of satiation and satiety after a meal. And that turns out to be a much better solution than trying to eliminate all carbs and just never feeling great, you know? Yeah. So I just want to say that um, there is, uh, it's possible that, that your magic recipe, Chrissy, that helps you kind of control your calorie intake and optimizes your nutrition, but also makes you feel uh, well-fed, you know, and, and feel good does involve, you know, some whole grains with every meal and or, or I'm sorry, some whole grains with some of your meals or, or, or something that isn't, that doesn't completely eliminate those foods. And I think that that's fine too, as long as it's in the context of a balanced diet, you get a, you're getting the right number of, of calories every day, then I don't think that there's any um, thing, there's no magic thing about the carbs that's going to make you gain weight either if you're eating them in appropriate amounts and, and in the context yep, yeah. of a healthy diet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm tempted to get into all kinds of like genetics and stuff like that, but we're already at 1027. We're almost, we've almost taken the whole half hour and I have a couple other questions to, to answer. So um, do you, you want to stick around, Monica? I'll, I'll watch the rest offline. And... Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to, I'll talk to you later. Thanks okay. everybody. Give Monica a big wave from Bye, your. Everybody. I'm going to stay in the meeting. I'm just going to get off camera. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, all right. So the next question came from Kirby and oh yeah, Kirby asked about, she's doing a, a Spartan sprint in three weeks. And this question is from eh, close to a week ago and was wondering and is feeling, she's feeling grossly unprepared for, for the Spartan sprint. Um, then she talks about all the, the things she's having trouble with and stuff. And then, okay, the, so the question is, what should I focus on for a crash course over the next few weeks? Um, and my advice about that really is that at this point, especially because this was a week ago and there's only three weeks, and you're going to want to do like a taper or a rest period before the race actually happens, that trying to build fitness at this point or try to do a bunch of panic training, as we like to call it, um, in at yeah, the last minute is more likely to leave you tired and sore and injured than it will actually make you better, make you more proficient at those, those uh, obstacles and the things you're going to have to do in the Spartan race. So my advice is instead of trying to do a whole bunch of panic training and, and see what you can do is to spend some time going through what you're going to have to do on race day. So getting good at doing some hand over hand things like go to the playground and play on the monkey bars for a little bit and get better at handling that actual, um, that actual type of workout or that type of obstacle 
um, do some spear throwing, do <laughs> some burpees because you may end up doing some burpees, just familiarizing yourself and getting that, um, like Monica and I were talking about earlier with her pull-ups, the neuromuscular connections that happen when you do a new movement. So you don't have that day, your race day, be the first time or even the 10th time that you've done that particular workout or that particular move. Do that now so you've got that advantage because that's actually going to pay off bigger dividends at this point in your in your training period than trying to do panic training because you're not going to gain a lot of strength or a lot of fitness in in that short amount of time, unfortunately. But what you can gain is the knowledge of how to execute those moves. So that's my my advice there. And Nuala asked, and this was sort of a, we went back and forth a little bit on, on Facebook about this one. She said, I'm a big fan of the podcast and I was wondering if you could do one on the best exercise exercises or adaptations for those with knee pain or how to build fitness to take off the stress on them during or to help them day to day. She finds squats and lunges are harder on the knees than the, than the rest of my legs some days, which uh, does get in the way at times. So there are a couple of links that, that Morgan will paste into, uh, into the, the comments there. Um, from the previous Get Fit guy, a uh, fellow named Ben Greenfield, I've almost been here a year now, but if you've only been following the Get Fit guy for a while, there was actually a, a Get Fit guy before me, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, his name is Ben Greenfield, and he wrote a few articles about how to um, how to exercise, how to do cardio, how to do stuff with knee injuries or, or bad, bad knees. But my advice is that whenever you start a new exercise move or a new regime or something like that, we are all going to have some sort of deficit. Like there's always going to be something that either doesn't work quite as well, maybe hurts a little bit. Maybe there's a limitation in our mobility or our flexibility. Like we can't get our leg <laughs> when I do yoga and I try to get into like a, a really deep lunge and then you pull your foot up behind you when you're in a lunge. I always get a quad cramp when I'm doing that. So we all need to realize and, and understand that we are all starting from a different place and we all have sort of a different set point um, when we start a, a new move. And if something hurts, if there's a limitation, if there's a mobility issue, that's okay. We all have them and that's just where you happen to be right now. So you need to work within those limitations and not try to be like, oh, I'm not doing it right. Well, you're not doing it as good as you may do it later on when you get used to it, but for now, this is your move. So if you're squatting, let's say, and you can only, you can't get to 90 degrees, that's okay. You will someday, you will eventually. If you're, if you're like Noala and you've got knee pain, when you do those, find that spot where the knee pain begins and don't get quite there, but still practice that movement in the range of motion that is available to you. Eventually those muscles will start to strengthen. Your mobility will start to increase and hopefully you will, you'll be able to do them in a full range of motion. Now with a big caveat of being, I don't know what your limitations are. If you have like, if you haven't seen a, a sports um, physical therapist or physiotherapist or a sport doc of some sort to find out if there is a reason why you should not be doing that, like osteoarthritis or something like that, that's a different case. We don't want to, don't want to fool around with that. But if it's just a soreness, if it's just a immobility, if it's a stiffness or something, then that's your range of motion. Practice that. It'll eventually get bigger and bigger. And I talked about that in the, um, the post about squats, that you don't want to force your body into a position that it's not ready for. Instead, practice the position that it can gather with the intention to eventually get into that proper, the perfect range of motion. So that's my answer to that. We're going a few minutes over, but I saw a couple of questions I thought were really interesting. It came in. Yeah. Michael, Michael said last week, I went to a local gym on a guest pass and I saw a bizarre machine called a power plate. Um, it looked very heavy. It looked like a heavy weight scale and is apparently a vibration machine. Can you tell me what this odd device is supposed to do? And is it useful? Um, yeah, it is a, it's a vibration platform and a lot of them are extremely heavy and they have a really heavy motor in them and they basically just shake like crazy and they shake in, in every direction. So they're not just necessarily going in one direction. And the idea is that when you're on that machine, it can, um, 
increase your lymph fluid drainage. So it's a really hard thing to quantify, but a lot of people use vibration platforms to help just that lymph fluid um, keep circulating a little bit more. You honestly can get the same benefit from going for a walk or even just sort of shaking yourself. I know some people who use like one of those rebounders, one of those small trampolines for the same purposes. Sometimes you hear them referred to um, for increasing bone density. Now, I haven't seen a lot of studies that back that up in a really significant way, except for NASA studies when, um, when astronauts are, are suspended in space for a really long time. They either use them there or when they return to Earth to, to help get sort of that, some of that bone density back because there is that astronaut um, bone density problem because they're, they're not <laughs> actually putting even their own body weight, never mind gravity, on their bones. A lot of us don't spend a lot of time in space, so I'm not sure that that's um, really all that important for most of us. Um, the thing that I do like about vibration platforms is that if you use them in conjunction with some sort of single leg squat or even a double leg squat or doing push-ups or something like that on it, is it does, let's say you're doing push-ups, it does force your body to use a few of those stabilizer muscles um, that you normally wouldn't be firing. It's sort of the same idea of being on a on a BOSU ball or a yoga ball or something. So you're, you're on a not quite steady surface. So you do have to sort of adjust yourself a little bit more and that can be helpful. It's the same reason why they say to get real strength, you want to use dumbbells when you're doing something like bench press rather than a barbell because, or even worse, like a, a machine that doesn't let you actually go out of that range of motion. It's a great place to start to build that proficiency, but then when you're past that point, the dumbbells are better because they don't move as a single unit and you do have to use more muscles to, to activate them. Same sort of idea with the vibration platform. So they're, they're fun. They're interesting. I wouldn't buy one for home per se, unless you've got every other piece of equipment that you want. It's, it's fun thing. If it's at the gym and you feel like using it, go into a, a squat and hold it on there and, and then try the same squad off of it and see if you feel different. I know I do for sure. Um, oh man, should have asked this while, while Monaco is here. Maybe um, Robin, Robin asked, is garlic bad for you? Have you gone over this topic in your podcast, Monica? Um, maybe Morgan can do a quick search and see if there is a, a link for that. But if not, or if you want to go into it more, maybe Monica can cover that um, next Friday at this exact time on her Facebook page, she'll be doing what she calls the table talk. And it's on Fridays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern time on the Nutrition Diva Facebook page. So that's next Friday. And Robin, I'm sure Monica will, will have, a, have an answer for you there for sure. And yeah, and we've gone like eight minutes over. So thanks everybody for coming out. Thank you, Monica, for, for joining us for the beginning of this this workout of the week. It was great to have another face and another voice on here. And thanks for asking all these awesome questions, you guys. I love it when you submit the questions ahead of time and we get a chance to think about it a little bit and really do a, a deep dive like we did on the reverse dieting. So I won't hold you guys up anymore. Yes, Robin, awesome. Yeah, keep an eye out for it. That's great. And um, yeah, everybody, Wendy, Michael, Bo, I feel like it's romper room. I've heard that in the romper room show, they do that. It's like, Corinne, I see you. Anyway, um, I'll stop fooling around and let you guys get on with your day. See you in two weeks for the next workout of the week. Bye, everybody. I'm Brock Armstrong, brockarmstrong.com. And of course, the brand new website at quickanddirtytips.com.